Tassa, Bhagavato, Arohato, Sama, Sambu, Dasa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suchedo ye olahudi sammyao samputo shi. Namo sadanto suchedo ye olahudi sammyao samputo shi. Wu shang shen shen wei miao fa, bai qian wan jie nan zao yu. Wo jin jian wan de shou chi, yuan jie ru lai zhen shi yi. Supreme and wondrous dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Shri Fu Shangren, Go Wei Shi Shung, Go Wei Boyo, Ami Tofo, Dharma Master, Shri Fu Shangren, Venerable monks, nuns, Dharma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture today. My name is Hung Shi. Uh, it is, let's see if I can. Get my self arranged here. There we go. Uh, it is Sunday, April 21st. We are heading out of Aries into Taurus, if you can imagine that. It is uh, Saturday, April 20th, back in California. We're here at Gold Coast Dharma Realm, and out of respect for our fearless sis up, I'm going to straighten my screen out so there's no angles. There we go. Okay. Now, uh, I want to express gratitude to all of the kind folks who are allowing this lecture to proceed, uh, putting it out around the world in not only English, but Chinese and Vietnamese translation as well. So, there we go. Okay, we want the Buddha's head just right. There we go. Excellent. Now, to continue with our protocol, uh, all the things that have to happen before our before we begin the lecture itself. Here we go. We're going to invoke spiritual presence, invite the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Flower Garland Assembly to draw near. We do that with a melody. Here we go. we said, that is designed to allow us to uh, welcome the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, Flower Garland Assembly, the Dharma Protectors, and express our wish that they attend, that they draw near. And I am not somebody who looks for dragons in clouds. Uh, I know there are folks in my community who do, who are very much interested in uh, looking for auspicious signs. kind of always 
wanting to test their faith that way. So, um, today I got an email that I thought was interesting. Uh, let's see here. Uh, is that it? Is that it? Oh. Uh -huh. Probably shouldn't be showing my email here. Let's see here. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, very good stuff here. Oh, oh, can't find it. Let's see. All right, can't see it. I'll just have to describe it, tell you what happened. There was a, uh, a lovely circle in the air over the Buddha Hall, a city of 10,000 Buddhas, completely round of clouds and like stunningly round. Uh, and it was, it looked like somebody had blown a smoke ring, poof, up into the air, uh, directly over city of 10,000 Buddhas. Um, at the city of 10,000 Buddhas, there are hundreds of people bowing the 10,000 Buddhas repentance ceremony, one for Bao Chan, which is our, kind of our signature Dharma assembly for the year. Uh, and overhead was this incredibly, if somebody uh, can send me that via, maybe Chun Yu can find a link and send it, that picture that was taken just yesterday. So anyway, back to our protocols, let's go. What do we have next? We have the bell song. No, we got a acknowledging country. That's next. Here we go. Let me share my screen. Here we go. We'll make it work. Come on now. Got to do full screen. There we go. All right. So we respectfully acknowledge the Kumbumeri people in the Ugambi language region as traditional storytellers and custodians of the land where our monastery is located. We pay respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and all First Nations people whose sovereignty was never ceded. So we say, Woman Gong Jing Di Cheng Ren, Ugambi Yuzu, the Kumbumali Ren. 是我们寺院所在地的传统叙事和守护人。我们向过去现在和未来的张人们，致敬，并且向所有从来没有放弃主权的第一民族的原住民致敬。There we go, and one more piece of protocol, which is delightful: the bell, bell sound. Bell sound wide resounds. Throughout a hundred million worlds, the Buddha's law is heard and spread. All throughout the triple world, the wondrous sounds that everywhere fill the Dharma realm with peace. May those who hear it gain the strength to follow in faith the Buddha's path. Zhong Sheng Chuan San Qian Jian Nei Fo Fa Yang Wan Yi Bo Zhong Gong Xun Qi Fa Jie He Ping Li Yi Bao Tan Wo Hu Du. Done. Okay, we've got some members of the uh, Dharma Protectors right there on the screen, making sure that all is in order. And if there are any small snakes, they'll be gobbled. Okay, now, um, today, we have a kind of a milestone in our lecture, in the progress through the chapter. What we're doing, we're explaining the Flower Garland Sutra, and the sutra is really big. It's a huge, huge text spoken by the Buddha. They say that this is the the first thing that the Buddha explained after his enlightenment. He looked through his wisdom vision and described the world that he saw. And uh, he described it raw, they said. There are people who looked at everything the Buddha spoke over 49 years of his teaching and 
they divided that 49-year period up into uh, five categories. And being India and sacred cows, they likened the five periods to butter, to milk products. That's what you do in India. And the, uh, the Avatamsaka period, this very first thing that he saw, they said, that's raw milk. That's milk right from the cow. Maybe it has some straw in it. It's unpasteurized, unhomogenized, unfiltered. It's not 2%. Even less is it almond or soy or oat milk. This is raw milk right from the cow. And so as a result, uh, it kind of intimidates a lot of people, the Avatamsaka, because it's, it's so much. Everything comes in tens, tens of this and tens of that. So if we were going to break up the sutra and say, how do we approach it? How do you kind of come to grips with something that big and that raw, you say, well, it's got two big pieces. One big piece is chapter one all the way to chapter 38. What is that? That's how somebody in theory should make the Bodhi resolve, fa putishin, to maximize their potential as a human. And two, that's how somebody should imitate a bodhisattva, learn the bodhisattva path, that is. And three, how to practice bodhisattva practices. Chapters 1 to 38 are all about that. So, for example, chapter 38, which is called Leaving the World, Li Shi Jianpin. Oh my goodness. There are maybe 10,000 different ways of practice. All these different wonderful things to do with your human life that benefit others. But then we get to the second part of the sutra, and it's only one chapter, chapter 39. And in this one chapter, we get a hero. We get a, the protagonist is the, the literary word. Somebody comes forward to take all of the stuff taught in chapters 1 to 38 and put it into practice. So in other words, the first 38 chapters are how you should do it. Chapter 39 is somebody does it. Who is that? His name is Sudhana. He's a young man, a pretty extraordinary guy, a lot of blessings. And this chapter 39 that we've been explaining now for, gee, I forgot the date when we started, maybe a year, possibly. Um, the Buddha comes up, he announces he's going to be talking about this. Uh, bodhisattvas fly in from ten directions, make offerings, they praise him. They sit down and they get ready to listen. Ooh, exciting moment. The Buddha speaks, he uh, talks about bodhisattvas, how wonderful they are as people. If you have a bodhisattva in your family, you're lucky. A bodhisattva in your workplace, wow, life is good. On your team, in your orchestra, uh, in your uh, Reddit subgroup, lucky to have somebody like that because they will be looking after your well-being as well as their own. Buddha praises them. And then Manjushri shows up. Oh, wow. And things start to accelerate when Manjushri shows up. He's the, they call him the mother of all bodhisattvas. So he gives birth to and nurtures all of the, the people who want to become bodhisattvas. Manjushri is the boss. He's the teacher. And so Shariputra shows up, and he's got with him 6,000 students, 6,000 young men and women who want to learn uh, from Shariputra, greatly wise. Shariputra himself looks at Manjushri and says, you all follow him. He's, he's got a lot to teach. Oh, my goodness. They take one look at him, and they enter samadhi. They have these uh, ability to speak eloquences appear. They have dharani. They can make sounds that are like mantras. Powerful changes. Just by the presence of Manjushri Bodhisattva, he's such a... Uh, uh, incredibly charismatic and wise person. All right, so um, 
Manjushri asks the Buddha for permission. I want to go down to the city of blessings down in the human realm. And of course, there are people who try to find that place on the actual map. And there's a lot of interesting, of course, where is the real city of blessings? Could it really be there on the map? Well, it's somewhere in southern India, they say. So, uh, spiritual geography, that's a discipline. So, okay, down comes Manjushri, and he, uh, uh, all the 6,000 bhikshus follow him now. They're now signed up as his disciples. And he goes to a place called the City of Blessings, and just east of the City of Blessings is a grove. It's a woods. It's a little forest. An orchard, maybe? No, it's more than that. And there's a famous uh, stupa there. There's a religious building where Buddhas have come before in the past. That's what they say. So the sutra locates it. We really have a sense of this being a place where people can go, uh, where stuff happens, where you take a picnic, where you go down if you want to fly a kite. Now I suppose you fly your drone from the park down there. And here's Manjushri. And along the way, 10,000 dragons appear and come and bow to Manjushri and he speaks a sutra. He explains a sutra just for the dragons. And many of the dragons go off to become devas or humans. They leave the realm of dragons to ascend in their evolution. And many of them decide they want to be bodhisattvas. They make the bodhi result. Okay, so that's cool. That's just kind of happens along the way. Now, the next thing that happens is from the city of blessings, the word goes out that Manjushri Bodhisattva is down in the park speaking Dharma. And wow, the excitement. This is the best thing that's happened to the city of blessings in a long time. So f four groups of 500 people go down to the park, carrying their blankets and their chairs and their picnic baskets. And you know there's music and there's banners and pennants and kites in the air. It's an exciting moment. And they're this is noisy. This is not, you know, hushed and, and uptight at all. Celebrating. Because here is the greatly wise Manjushri Bodhisattva. So, um, one group of 500 Upasikas, male uh, adults, come out. 500. They sit down. 500 female Upasikas come out. Adult females. They're there looking after their families and making sure the kids are not getting dirty in, in, the, in the grass, you know, doing what kids do. And so then 500 young boys come forward. They're called kumara, tongzi uh, in Chinese. And they have somebody at the head who is their, kind of their leader. Who is it? Sudana. He's our very guy. Then 500 young women come forward, Upasika. And I just want to point out that um, the sutra specifies no difference between the young men and the young women. And the young women are an equal half part of the audience. I think that's significant, right? It is not the case that the Buddha Dharma was spoken for half of one Dharma realm men only, not. The, the sutra specifies 2,000 people show up at Manjushri's Dharma talk and 500 of them are adult women, 500 of them are young women. So how about that? I think that's, pay attention to that because Buddha Dharma is as unmisogynistic a teaching as you can find in the world. Um, and then there are people who will say, yeah, but how come there are no Tibetan nuns? Yeah, how come there are no Thai nuns? Well, that's cultural. It's not in the sutras at all. That's cultural. So ask Tibetan culture, ask Thai culture uh, for about status of women. So within the Buddha Dharma, it is ping dung, equal, impartial, identical. All right. The Buddha nature is the same regardless of what body you're wearing. That's the point. Okay, now, 
what happens? Well, we've been studying it for the last uh, few weeks now, and what happens is Manjushri looks over at the group of young men and goes, okay, you're here. <laughs> the reason I've come down. You are what is known as a tsai fa qi, someone who can hold the Dharma. You got what it takes to go all the way in one lifetime to Buddhahood. You can do it. So, wow, that's exciting. Manjushri praises his blessings, talks about how special he is. And uh, then, oh boy, Sudhana, in his turn, praises the Buddha. He hears about the Buddha and he gets all excited and he looks at Manjushri and he says, essentially, he says, that's what I want to do. Please sign me up. Uh, the words he uses, he uses automotive metaphors. It's really funny. We thought of the Beach Boys in Southern California hot rod culture. My little deuce coupe. Sudhana goes, I want to ride in that car. Let me ride in that car. And he praises the car about all how beautiful it is and what wonderful adornments he has. What's he talking about? Mahayana, the Da Chang, the great vehicle, right? The great vehicle. And it's a car, but that's a metaphor, obviously. So, but he, that's what he says. He's a young man, he's supposed to be 20 years old. And he says, I want to ride in that car. Please give it to me. Let me drive that car. And then he concludes by saying, please be compassionate and save me a seat. I want to, I want to do it. Sign me up. So Manjushri, in turn, one more time, says, good indeed. I'll give you some instructions and start you off on your pilgrimage. That's where we were last week. And Manjushri is, he says, you're ready to go. All the conditions are green. Time to go. What were uh, some of the, when we started uh, televising NASA space shots, right? Good to go. That was some of the, the lingo that was used around NASA talking about rockets taking off into outer space. Um, and Manjushri says to Sudhana, here's what you do. I'm going to tell you how to conduct your pilgrimage to set off from the City of Blessings to leave behind comfort and ease, go out into the wilds, because you're going to travel to a uh, hundred cities in search of Shan Zhi Shi. Ah, Manjushri says, when you go out to meet those Shan Zhi Shi, here's what you do. You tell them that you have made the Da Putishin, the great Bodhi resolve, uh, the great resolve for awakening, Bodhicitta, and ask them, one by one, ask them, how does somebody walk the bodhisattva path? How does somebody practice bodhisattva practices? They will answer you. Those are the instructions. So he says, he elaborates a bit. He says, when you see these good and wise advisors, these wise spiritual friends, make offerings to them, uh, get as close as you can to them, find them and bow, ask your questions, and uh, respect them, show, bow to them, and then do what they tell you. Go and, go and try it. Try it out. They want you to succeed. They will tell you what you need to know to accomplish your vows, your Bodhi vows. Okay, that's where we are. And uh, so when I say today is a milestone, it's because we get the very first pattern the first send-off from Manjushri that we're going to see repeated 53 times. This, this pattern that happens for the first time today uh, gets repeated. And we also, this is the end of one of our divisions of the sutras. The, uh, this is Jen Di San, I think, the third Jen, uh, ends today. So this is kind of, that's why it's exciting to see the, the actual... Uh, uh, the beginning of Sudhana's pilgrimage happens today.
So let's take a look here. Okay. We'll start. We've only got two, one and a half pages. So we actually saw this last week. We can repeat it just to get the context. Okay, here we go. Okay, everybody ready? Here we go. Er shi wen shu shi li pu sa shuo zi song yi gao shan cai tong zi yan shan zai shan zai shan zan zi ru yi fa an lo duo san miao san pu ti xin qiu pu sa heng shan nan zi ruo you zhong sheng neng fa an lo duo san miao san pu ti xin shi shi wei nan neng fa xin yi qiu pu sa heng at that time, Bodhisattva Manjushri, having chanted those verses, said to the youth Sudhana, Good indeed, good indeed, good man. You have already brought forth the resolve for Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi and seek the practices of a Bodhisattva. Good man, it's difficult indeed for beings to express the resolve for Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. Moreover, if they do express the resolve, for them further to wish to pursue the practices of a bodhisattva is twice as difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, so the key word here is difficult. Manjushri is kind of putting, a, a, putting it in context. So you're going to go, he says, Sadu, 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 well done, shantai, 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 well done. You have made the Bodhi resolve and you want to learn about Bodhisattva practices. Um, what's the big deal about that? Um, the big deal is right within the body of Buddhism, there are differences in goals, differences in views of what's important in being a Buddhist. And uh, for one particular school, one style of Buddhism, the goal is liberation. You just want to get out. You say the world is like a burning house and we can save ourselves from the burning house. The three realms, desire, form, and formless, are like a prison. Uh, birth and death, is like a dangerous whirlpool and we want out. That's the point. There's a lot of people who would say that's just an amazing accomplishment. That's what the prince, our Buddha, did. Shakyamuni. When he was Siddhartha, he said, I want to find out whether birth and death can end. And there are people who would tell you, well, ridiculous, death and taxes, right? That's the only real things, the only certain things. We're going to die and we have to pay taxes. So only two certain things in life, they say. Okay, well, to be able to say, yes, I'm going to put an end to mortality, that's already, some people would say, pie in the sky, impossible to do. Well, Buddhism exists because one person did that. Their, their challenge their project was to end birth and death, to leave samsara and reach nirvana. Now, you would not be wrong if you said, that's Buddhism. That's what it's all about, is leaving samsara, seeking nirvana. That's the end. Okay, now, what is going on with the Mahayana? The Bodhisattva path says different. It says personal liberation is not the end. The end is liberation for all beings with whom we are connected. And it's possible. <coughs> and people who set that as their goal are known as bodhisattvas, awakened beings. Okay, well that's interesting. Different, different explanation a different way of looking at what the purpose of the Buddhist path is all about. So Manjushri says, you have brought forth this resolve. You've decided to go beyond saving yourself 
to saving others. And you know what? That's rare. That's hard. That's really hard to do for somebody to make that their goal because it seems like seemed like a loser. He really seemed like a loser. And I had this amazing experience. Uh, I went over to Perth, Western Australia, uh, a decade ago to take part in a, a Buddhist conference. And I was, there were some Vietnamese bhikkhus, bhikshus there. But I was, I believe, the only uh, representative of the Chinese Mahayana, Han Chuan Fo Jiao, there. And uh, I was on the program as the representative. Actually, there were some uh, other bhikshunis there, but the Thai forest tradition was well represented, and uh, there were a lot of Zen people and, and that sort of thing. So my topic was the Bodhisattva path, and as I started out in my talk, standing there at the podium, palms together, saying, giving my opening greetings to everybody and gratitude at being invited, a Thai bhikshu, I won't mention his name, he came out of his seat and he said, excuse me, excuse me, he said, uh, before you start, he said, I just want to get clear. He says, do you really want us to believe that there is any person who faced with birth and death and all the suffering lifetimes of, of dukkha, faced with the opportunity to leave dukkha behind and to reach nirvana, would ever not take that opportunity and instead wait around for some airy-fairy living beings? Is there anybody who would be that stupid? He said, <laughs> and yeah, frankly, I think there, there, there are. In fact, they're called bodhisattvas, and uh, uh, you could take the, you know, a hundred volumes of the Mahayana Buddhist canon telling the story of the Bodhisattva path as proof that there are people that stupid. Stupid they are to, uh, to not grab for the gold and, and cash in their chips and split. Yeah, there are people like that, thank goodness. <laughs> but right, I mean, there were 400 people in the audience and they all went, because <gasps> it was pretty rude for him to like call in question that the sanity or the, the bodhisattva path. And he, we had a good time. We, we've become friends since then and he's read a little more and he knows about Guanyin Bodhisattva, he knows about Prajnaparamita, uh, he knows about the, uh, you know, the Mahayana Sutras and, and all that. Uh, so anyway, but that was my kind of my splash of cold water awareness that not everybody thinks Bodhisattva path is, is a wise choice. Because why? As Master Hua would say, you have to take a loss. People who cultivate the Bodhisattva path, Chukui, they take a loss. They, take a they don't go first. They don't grab for all the gusto you can get because you're only coming around once in a lifetime, as Budweiser beer would tell you. Uh, they, th taking a loss means the benefits go to others. You cultivate for merit and virtue and you give it away. That's, that's called shukwe, taking a loss. And it's even personified even more. There's a traditional kind of monastic way of referring to bodhisattvas as they say, oh, you remember when the Buddha in a past lifetime uh, saw a hungry mother tiger with three cubs down in a pit. The mother and her babies had fallen into a hunter's pit and the mother had not gotten anything to eat and the babies were starving. There were four lives on the line. So what did the bodhisattva do? Bodhisattva tossed his own body down into the pit so the mother tiger could eat his body and then have enough to feed her three cubs. There's a bodhisattva. Wow. <laughs> oh no. I can hear my mother saying, You're going to be a Buddhist. You're going to give your body to a tiger? Mm, not today, Mom. If I get the opportunity, I, I might go look for some mock meat to feed the tiger. 
And then there's another bodhisattva who cut off pieces of his flesh to feed a hungry hawk. Uh, what happened? <laughs> Story goes. So a hawk was chasing a pigeon. And the compassionate bodhisattva saw the hawk, saw, the, saw this chase, and he knew that it was going to result in the death of the pigeon because it was a peregrine falcon, really the fastest flying bird in the world. So what did he do? He opened his robe and the pigeon took refuge inside his robe. And Big Shu closed it. And in the story, the, the falcon could talk. And the falcon says, hey, your compassion is nice, but you know what? It's one-sided. You might save the pigeon, but I'm gonna starve. That's my food. How does that work? You're just as selfish as anybody. So the bodhisattva takes out a knife and cuts off pieces of his own flesh and feeds the hawk. So he saves both lives that way, taking a loss. That's what it's called, chukwe. So these are traditional. Now, kids, don't try this at home. If you have a hungry tiger nearby, uh, find an option that doesn't involve uh, giving your body to it. And if you have hungry falcons, um, Find another solution than cutting off fingers, all right? So I'm speaking figuratively, not literally, as I tell you about the bodhisattva. Now, bodhisattvas do, on the other hand, uh, behave selflessly every opportunity they get. When there's a chance to yield instead of fighting, they yield. If there's a chance to give instead of being greedy, they prefer to be generous. If there's a chance to be content instead of seeking some other high, they will take the old, the familiar, the well-used, and say, I am content. I have enough. I'm grateful. Share the blessing. Hallelujah. If they have a chance to be selfish, they'll be selfless. If they have a chance to take it all, they'll share it instead. If they have a chance to lie, bodhisattvas will tell the truth. So, rang ar bu zheng, bu shi ar bu tan, zhi zu ar wu so qiu, ah. Right? That's Bodhisattva's taking a loss. That's what it means. Okay, back to our sutra. Here we go. It's hard. It's hard to get people to do that because it seems like the world loves you. You got to win. You got to all win. No matter what. We have an example of that in American culture right now. Somebody who is not practicing the bodhisattva. It's probably the opposite example of bodhisattvas because his vow is, I must win. I am not a loser. Moreover, says Manjushri, Nang fa xin yi qiu pu sa heng pei geng wei nan. Moreover, if they express that resolve, for them to want to pursue practices of a bodhisattva, twice as difficult. Okay. Here come the instructions. This is the key. Here's the milestone. Ready? Shan says, good man, should you wish to accomplish the wisdom of omniscience, you must decisively seek a true good advisor. Good man, in seeking a good advisor, do not be weary or lax. Upon encountering a good advisor, do not become complacent. You must accord and comply with all the good advisor's teaching. You must not find fault with the skillful means the good advisor uses. Okay, some detailed advice. Okay, first uh, emphasis, right? Shanjir, good advisor, good advisor, good advisor, good advisor. This is all about Kalyana Mitra, good spiritual friends. We've got a bunch of translations for it. So, good advisor. We used to say good and uh, good knowing one. That's not English. It's Chinglish. Shan zhi shi, good knowing one, somebody who's a good friend on the spiritual side, who is more concerned with who you are inside than who you are outside. 
That's definitely a key to a good advisor. Um, Shurfu would say things like, you know how to tell a good advisor? The words, they, t they always tell you the truth, even when it's hard to hear. Uh, and then he would follow up with that wonderful Chinese idiom, uh, shan yao ku kou er li yu bing. Uh, cheng yan li er er li yu xing. He would say, good medicine is often bitter to the taste, but it cures your illness. True words or honest words, they offend the ear, but they put you back on the path. Shurfa would say often, I don't care who's unhappy with me, I am going to tell the truth. He would say that a lot. And it's true that when you tell the truth, even if it's hard to hear, people don't like it. <laughs> it's not sweet. Uh, but he, Shurfa would always like flip that over and say, when somebody praises you, be careful. They may not be your true friend. Often, uh, flattery. Flattery is there to inflate yourself, your view of self, which is not the truth. Whereas a good and wise advisor, a good spiritual friend, they will tell you the truth even when it's like, oh, kind of deflates the ego. That's a true spiritual friend. And it's, it's really not, quote, the popular view. This is not the way, you know, uh, the marketplace would have it. The marketplace, oh, it looks, and what do you think, honey? Does, it make, does this dress make me look fat? <laughs> uh, well, mm, it's lovely, dear. <laughs> yes, it does. It makes you look fat. Oh, big trouble. Oh, don't answer that one. So, yeah, that's, the, you have to also be wise as you do this. So, good and wise advisors will not not flatter for the purpose of puffing you up to take advantage of your inflated sense of self, right? This is subtle stuff, but this is exactly where wisdom works. Shan yao ku ko er li yu bing. Really good medicine? It's bitter. Ooh. Chinese medicine? Wow. People who've had the experience of Chinese medicine? <laughs> yeah, even the smell. We have, uh, at the Berkeley Monastery, we have what's called a Yaba Shifu, a, uh, a mute wife. That's the funny name. It's a Chinese herbal medicine pot. And it's, it's just devoted to this purpose alone because if you go to a traditional Chinese herbal shop, the, the one with all the drawers, and the pharmacist is there, and he's got a prescription from a Chinese doctor and the prescription says some lingzhi and some uh, uh, huanglian and some uh, gansao and some, uh, uh, what would it be? Maybe there's some he uh, shou wu, you know. These are actual Chinese herbs that came from nature. Those names are things like mushrooms and tree bark and powdered roots and leaves and branches and stems and twigs. And when you're done, you've got this paper package with stuff that if you tried to get on the airplane with it, they would stop you. At the TSA would stop you before you get, because it's raw plants from the, from the mountains. And what you do is you take them home, put them in the yabashifu in this pot, and fill it with water, put it on the fire, and it starts to cook. And it cooks slowly. A, a yaba shifu, a Chinese medicine pot, is basically a slow cooker. That's Western kitchens have slow cookers. So this pot, oh my goodness, it cooks and it cooks and it cooks, and the house stinks. Oh, the smell coming out of that pot. We always know when somebody's been to see the Chinese doctor because from the kitchen comes this smell. We, uh, uh, I know there are some uh, monasteries where they say anybody cooking herbs, put the pot outdoors. Run an extension cord, 
we're not going to have the entire house smell like Chinese herbs. And sometimes the, uh, if the formula is bitter, it's really, often it is really bitter, the smell is really bitter. You can just smell it. And you know, it boils, so like you boil it slowly until like three cups of water boil down to one cup. When you're done, you've got one cup of liquid and the dregs of this bark and roots and mushrooms and branches and leaves and seeds and you pour it out into a bowl <laughs> and if it's the, the mom or the dad or the, the abbot says, here it is, drink it. And you go, oh, you hold your nose and you choke it down. And guess what happens? You get better. Your illness goes away. <laughs> And mostly because you say, I'll do anything except drink that again. I'll, I'll even let go of my illness just so I don't have to drink it again. Oh, of course, I'm exaggerating a bit, but not much. Chinese traditional medicine is really bitter. Hao yao ku ko or li yu bing. So a good and wise advisor will not flatter you. He or she will not put honey on the words to make you happier, right? They will tell you the truth. Because why? Just like bitter Chinese medicine, it punctures the ego, which you don't want. You want to get back to the truth of the emptiness of all conditioned things. So, good man, if you wish to accomplish the wisdom of a bodhisattva, look for good spiritual friends. When you go out there looking for them, don't get tired because they're not in, you know, every street corner. When you meet them, don't be complacent. The uh, Chinese for that is soyo jing, let's see here, let's see. Jian shan zhi shi, wu sheng yan zhu. Complacent means don't get fed up. Don't, don't say enough, enough. I can't take any more truth here. That shirfu is just too, you know, hard to approach. Don't do that, he says. Stick with it. Subdue your ego and listen to what they say. Accord with and comply with the good advisor's teachings. Don't find fault with their skillful means. Now, this is key. This, this part right here is tricky because... Is it a true good and wise advisor? You have to use wisdom here. And um, as I, uh, we encounter these words for the first time, I want to be clear. Some people would take Manjushri's advice and say, wow, I really like that. I'm going to put up with everything that my renegade, wild man, undisciplined teacher does, even when my conscience, even when my good sense says, no, that's wrong. There are people who will interpret it literally like that. And you got to be careful. So, on one hand, I want everybody to take the sutra's words. What is he saying? He's saying, let's look at it one more time. Here's the first time we've had this complication. If you want to become wise like the Buddha, go find good teachers. True, true, good teachers. If you want to do that, you want to seek a good teacher, don't get tired. Don't, you know, go down halfway down the list and quit. When you meet one, don't think it's such a no big deal. The teacher might, might be sick, might have an illness. The teacher might not be a good dresser, a snappy dresser. The teacher might you might have trouble understanding their dialect, right? They might have bad breath. All of the things that ordinarily you'd say, well, no thanks. 
But if it's a true, good, and wise advisor, Manjushri says, you have to be patient, practice patience, look past the surface to tell whether this is a good advisor. But then here's the complication right here. This is the problem. Yu shan zhi shi suo yu jiao hui jing sui shun. Yu shan zhi shi shan chao fang bian wu shan guo shi. Accord and comply with everything the good advisor teaches. Don't find fault with their skillful means. All right. Now, ding, 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 ding. We want to pay attention here. Why is that? Because, let me give you my experience in San Francisco in the 60s and 70s. There are famous cults in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, in California, in the United States. Somehow the Bay Area attracted so many of them who were not Shan They were not good advisors. They weren't spiritual friends. Um, we had a group not far from us. We were in the Mission District, Gold Mountain Monastery. And while Master Hua was explaining the Avatamsaka Sutra, we, at the same time, I was there 19, from 1974 on, we would go to uh, the Safeway grocery store in the Mission District and go dumpster diving because Safeway had this uh, policy of as soon as fruit turns slightly bad, they have to dump it. The apples get a little bit brown. As soon as bread is day old bread, they can't sell it. They have to get rid of it. So they would just dump it in the dumpster. And we would go check the dumpster, come home with 12 loaves of bread that was fresh yesterday and lots of vegetables that, you know, celery and tomatoes and that were just tossed out. America wastes a lot of food. And there at the dumpster, we would meet the disciples of other teachers uh, from other, uh, other groups and who were also looking for the throwaway food. And we would hear stories about the way their teacher taught them. And there was one in particular, and I, I won't be able to, I won't give you the names because I'm sure there are disciples who would be very unhappy if they heard the story. But there was one in particular, uh, infamous guy, who had a bad temper and he would pick on his disciples, scold them, hit them, and they excused it all as being skillful, expedient means. And we would meet them behind Safeway and they would just say, what's it like at Gold Mountain? Because our teacher has a bad temper. And they would unload, and some of the stories were really scary. And then it went into actual, not just physical abuse, but sexual abuse. And that particular teacher wound up in jail. He traveled, he went to Oregon, then he went to Colorado, and reestablished, then he went to Hawaii, and a couple of his disciples committed suicide, and then he wound up uh, behind bars. And his disciples, who we met when he was still young uh, in his, his group, before the worst of it came out, they um, drifted on. And how sad, you know. Uh, in the Buddhist world, we had a Tibetan teacher who, whose misbehavior actually made the New York Times. There was a major expose because his group uh, were importing military weapons, military grade weapons, fully automatic weapons. Uh, and this Tibetan teacher, uh, he was famous for uh, fathering children with his female disciples and he finally died of cirrhosis of the liver, alcohol poisoning. Uh, his disciple, his Dharma heir, uh, went on to get full-blown AIDS and slept 
with men and women, women and men, in his organization, giving them full-blown AIDS. When he was interviewed, said, you knew you had AIDS, not HIV, you had AIDS, and you still had encounters with members of your staff? He said, yeah, well, I understood from my teacher that I had grace, that I was an exception because I'd been anointed as, you know. And so these are not good and wise advisors. The, the Tibetan teacher's expedient means were he would demand interviews, but you had to wait outside his door in the hallway for hours. And you would, that was part of the training, is you had to practice your patience waiting to see Shurfu uh, outdoor, just sitting there. And he finally um, died of, of alcohol poisoning. So this is as we, now, how do you explain this is, what's the difference? Well, the difference is, notice he says, Good man, you should one wish to accomplish the wisdom of omniscience, you must decisively seek a true Yao Chou Zhen Zhen Shan Zhi Shi. Okay, a true good and wise advisor. How do you tell the difference? Well, uh, Master Hua gave us six guidelines. He said, This is the standard by which we judge whether an advisor is true or not. What are they? Is the person contentious? Do they constantly put others down to elevate themselves? Yi Ren Yang Ji, right? They find faults with other teachers constantly, and as a result, elevate their own status. If you find that, if the person is constantly critical of everyone else, with the exception of themselves, then what's the difference? The self is there. Affliction is there. They will not be able to guide you past your own afflictions because of the presence of the self, right? The self is still there. Number two, he said, so in other words, Wu Zheng in Chinese, no fighting. Fighting is not slugging it out, it's contention, seeking to go over others, wanting to be number one, fighting to be the best, the most. A true good and wise advisor will, you don't even notice them. They're, they're helping you unpack yourself. So the idea of fighting to be number one and the best, that's so far away from the goal of cultivation, which is to remove this sense of separation, of the dimensions of the ego. You want to find a way to remove that, to bit by bit gradually reduce the, the self in the middle, the big me. Uh, so much the less are they out there fighting to be the best, the number one, the most disciples, biggest temples, most offerings, etc. So, Bu Zheng, not fighting. Number two, here's the other standard he gave us. He said, is the teacher, the person you're interested in, greedy? Are they greedy for more? Is it bigger temples, more disciples, right? Better food, better pizza, right? Do they pit lay people against each other competing to get better offerings from this family or that family? Are they greedy for fame? Do you see their picture in, over every doorway? Do you see, uh, are they there to meet the politicians and shake hands and become uh, better known to the power structure? Well, if so, how are they going to help you identify when greed rises in your mind, right? Greed is poison, it's an affliction. So if you see your teacher being greedy, instead of helping you understand the wisdom of your own nature, chances are, if you get close to them, your progress is gonna be slow. 
because they're increasing affliction in themselves. So those are good standards. So in other words, Bhutan, right? Bhujang Bhutan, no fighting, no greed. Well, apply that to the good and wise advisor and it helps you understand whether or not you should get involved in that teacher's group, following their teachings, etc. Number three, he said, in Chinese is buqiu, not seeking. So what is seeking? We, um, last night, here at GCDR, we had a wonderful lecture on the Tao from a, uh, a good advisor in uh, medical science, Chinese medical science, beyond just medicine. Uh, Dr. Zhang is a student of the essence of Chinese culture, which takes the Tao as its center. And Tao is this incredible uh, way of looking at humanity in the universe. There's heaven, there's earth, and there's people in between. And this, uh, from the point of view of medicine, you, you look at it in terms of the seasons. As the yin increases, the energy goes down to the roots, and your diet should reflect that. You have to add more clothing because it's cold in the morning. And you adjust as the seasons turn, you adjust. Because why? The earth is circling the sun, and the moon is circling the earth, and we're further away, and we're above. And so the Tao is always adjusting and turning, turning to find the middle. And this is, you just, you can't argue with it. This is fundamental earth science. And uh, a, a wise person will get in harmony with it because anything that counters the Tao is going to fail. It's going to break. It's not supported. So this third guideline, Bu Chiu, seeking is what? It just means not content to notice, learn the Tao, and accord. You push the flow instead of responding to the flow. The result is affliction, seeking. You're never content. You're not looking at the world around you. So a true good and wise advisor will always help you accord to sui yuan bu bian, to accord the conditions and not change. So uh, an, a, uh, uh, a, a not beneficial advisor, someone who's not going to be able to help you learn the Tao and learn how to accord, is out there uh, pushy, right? Insisting on more and new. You got to do it better and faster and more, right? Grab for all the gusto you can get. So this is, these are guidelines that Master Hua left to say, use your wisdom. Nobody can tell you whether this is a true, good, and wise advisor for yourself. Other people may find just stockpiling automatic weapons uh, is, is beneficial to their path. We've had these stories before. Okay, we've also had, remember Rajneesh in America? He had 10 Rolls Royces out in Antelope, Oregon, the city that he took over uh, before his chief of police uh, attacked the local postmaster and chief uh, Rajneesh's own chief of police in Antelope. The, the guru's uh, military wing uh, spread um, uh, anthrax, anthrax, the only domestic chemical weapon attack in American history happened at the hands of a guru. Rajneesh, who had 10 Rolls Royces and practiced uh, practices that offended the Tao. So he wound up, they got him for tax evasion and for immigration violations. So, yeah. Anyway, America has had its exposure to uh, not so wise advisors, including, I must admit, Ukiah, California, uh, where City of 10,000 Buddhas is located was the home for three years of Jim Jones. Jim Jones from People's Temple. Uh, Jim Jones started out as a populist uh, social enterprise, uh, public welfare relief 
pastor in San Francisco, but something happened. And uh, he went up to Ukiah, and a young man in his congregation died. And Jim Jones was convinced that he was going to raise him from the dead. So this young man lay on a, a beer. He lay on a, uh, a stone table for three days while Jim Jones was laboring to get him to come back to life. The, the local police authorities finally arrested him, threw him in jail as a, uh, a charlatan and buried the young man. Um, Jim Jones took his disciples down to Guyana, the country in South America. 900 of them drank Kool-Aid laced with arsenic and died. Literally, Tongwe Yujin, right? It was 900 people. There's not a good and wise advisor. That's the opposite. So when we hear, now why am I going on like this? When we hear Manjushri Bodhisattva saying, you must accord with and comply with all the good advisors' teachings. Don't find fault with their skillful means. Yes, if they are true good advisors. How do we know? Use City of 10,000 Buddhas, six guidelines. Yielding and not contending. Generous and not greedy. Content and not seeking. Unselfish, not selfish. Sharing the benefits, not taking them all. Telling the truth, not lying. Those are the six. And if you look carefully, really look carefully at the person you're following, and if they don't display fighting greed, seeking selfishness, benefits, and dishonesty, follow them. There's a lot to learn. If they do have those habits, chances are they themselves are still caught up in affliction. And they may not be able to help me straighten out my mind. Okay? That's the way to approach it. You never know. The person who you're following may be pretending to be afflicted and greedy and fighting and seeking. So to get rid of a number of disciples, then their true face comes out. We'll see. Whatever. Here we go. Ready? Here's the moment. Here's the milestone. Shan 不是菩萨道吗？乃至菩萨云何与普贤恒，积德圆满，德运比丘，当为如说。Okay, okay, there it is. Good man, south of here is called a kingdom named Supreme Bliss. Within that kingdom is a mountain called Wonderful Summit. On that mountain is a bhikshu named Cloud of Virtue. Go to him, ask him how a bodhisattva learns, bodhisattva practices how a bodhisattva cultivates bodhisattva practices, even how a bodhisattva can swiftly perfect the practices of, here it is again, Samantabhadra. Bhikshu Cloud of Virtue will explain all of this for you. Oh boy, there it is, that's the first one. This pattern is repeated 50 plus times. Each teacher in turn tells Sudhana the same thing. You go south, there's another teacher, what I know is limited. He will tell you how to cultivate, practice, walk the Bodhisattva path. Um, now here, Manjushri, interestingly, is not saying, Sudhana, good man, learn from me, follow me. I will teach you what you need. You be my disciple. He's saying, no, 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 no. Over there, another monk, cloud of virtue, will tell you, Ask him about Samantabhadra. Look at that. How unselfish are these teachers? They always pass them on to the next teacher. Okay, conclusion at the end of our chapter. Ready? Okay, 
头顶离足，绕无数匝，殷勤瞻仰，悲泣流泪，辞退难行。After hearing these words, the youth Sudana leapt for joy, bowed at his feet, circled him countless times, gazed up at him with longing admiration. He wept sorrowfully, bade him farewell, took his leave, and went south. There you go. Now, who says this Avatamsaka Sutra is nothing but philosophy, impossible to understand? Come on, get over that. This is not philosophy. After hearing these words, Sudhana leapt for joy. He was so happy to get initiated into the, his pilgrimage. He bowed at Manjushri's feet, walked around him, looked up at him with emotion, and then cried. You're my sherpa, and you're sending me away. Said goodbye, and set off on his journey. There it is. The end of the third gen. Now, look what I got. Oh boy, I prepared this for you all. Thanks to our team of supporters. Yi Huan and Alan and Chun Yu and Jerry and everyone, look who's there: Manjushri Bodhisattva, surrounded by, whoa, six thousand big shoes, uh, dragons, dragon girls. He's got lots of flowers around him. He's turning his head the way elephants do. Up here, Dharma protectors looking all weird. Devas. Making offerings. Look at this dharma. Look at this guy. He looks like a pirate. Oh man, what a scene! This is the grove east of City of Blessings. Fu Chang Dong Shu Lin. There's a stupa here. That's where the teaching is taking place. Oh man. Who is this? Sudana, that's him. There's our pilgrim. Notice he's portrayed as a little boy. He's not. That's just the artist's conception. But he's starting out. Now these illustrations are so priceless. This is Fo Guo Chan Shi, Chan Master Buddha Country, Fo Guo. Who in the Song Dynasty took every one of Sudhana's trip、uh, visits and did a woodblock print. Further,、um, a Song Dynasty, a Song Dynasty monk, wrote a poem. Manjushri and the six thousand bhikshus and the great stupa at the Sala Grove, east of the city of blessing.、Um, another monk wrote. Here we go. A summary of what happened in each different episode. Not that one. Here we go. There we are. Okay. Huayan Rufa Jiepin Wen Shu Shi Li, ah, Shan Cai Zhi Nan Xun Shan Zhi Shi Tu Zan, praise of the picture of Manjushri Bodhisattva sending Sudana to the south in search of teachers from the Avatamsaka Sutras entering the Dharma Realm chapter.、Um, Tokyo, eastern capital, Fa Yun Si, Shaman Wei Bai. This was written by a monk called Wei Bai. From the Song Dynasty, and it's a story about this encounter with Manjushri. He says, "Let's see how much time do we have." He says,、uh, "In the city of blessings, in Shravasti, in the Jada Grove, the Buddha entered the lion's stretch samadhi and brought limitless great bodhisattvas, each to." Realization, as the youth Manjushri in the body of a youth came out of the Jada Grove 
and entered into the human realm where he met Shariputra and 6,000 bhikshus. Manjushri, uh, like the a lion, like, like the king of elephants, turned his head around to view them and saw all the bhikshus and, sorry, going so fast here, Cliff, um, that at that time, the 6,000 bhikshus, when they heard his teachings, all chunged out, realized the way. Manjushri then traveled to the city of blessings where there was a grove of sala trees, a park on the eastern side, and a great stupa. And he explained the sutra of shining light on the Dharma realm and 10,000 dragons heard it. 500 upasikas and upasikas also came out um, 500 young men and young women, Kumaris and Kumaras, including Sudhana, who was their leader. And they all came to where Manjushri was and made offerings and bowed to him. And they all heard the Dharma, the essentials of the Dharma. These five assemblies, dragons, and then the four Upasikas, Upasikas, Kumara, Kumaris, uh, got incredible benefits and made this Bodhi resolve. Manjushri at that point, again, like the king of elephants turning his head, giving you full attention, which is pretty awesome, looked at Sudhana and said, uh, you young man have got fundamental wisdom. He pointed out the compass. He said, you go south and taught him this Dharma door. And he realized the 10 stages of faith the shi xin. Then at that point, he made a praise. He praised him. Okay, now here's the deal. Each one of these encounters has a verse that came apparently from uh, Wei Bai, this monk from the Song Dynasty, and the verses are so good. They're really, really good. Here it comes. Listen. Chu lin huan yo Ru Lin Zhong Bian Shi So Lo Fo Miao Dong Shi Zi Ho Shi Fang Cao Lu Xiang Wang Juan Gu Luo Hua Hong Liu Qian Qi Shi Shi Xin Man Wu Zhong Gao Ren Yi Xin Tong Yu Zhong Wu Shi Xiang Nan Chu Bai Cheng Yan Shui Miao Wu Chong. Right? Oh man, these are so incredibly good. So, what we've got, we have a translation. And um, I'll show you because our original publications, the Buddhist Text Translation Society, published these back in the 80s. And here they are. If you have a set of these originals with the hand calligraphy on the cover, hold on to them. They're rare. Uh, here at Gold Coast Dharma Realm, we don't have a complete set. Uh, the, uh, somehow, volume one and volume two are missing. Mayola. From three to six, three to, we have three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Volume one and volume two. Somebody borrowed them. It might have been me. I might have taken them out and it might be somewhere. Uh, we have to go back through the, the log and see who took them out. Because why? They're published in the 80s. They are now 40 years old. And they're done by hand. We typed them on an IBM Selectric typewriter. And the calligraphy of the covers is done by hand. This is done by Bhikshuni Hang Liang and uh, Jerry Joe Adarius, who was a calligrapher in Ukiah. Here they are. This is volume one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and chapter 40. Okay? Now, the thing about these, you can buy the whole set for 126, but it's not complete. We didn't publish all of the Avatamsaka at that time. It cost you 126 US dollars. They, they accompany each of Sudhana's visits with 
the illustration like Manjushri, the story and the verse by uh, Wei Bai, Basher, and the hand calligraphy English translation. Look at it. This is italic. This is chancery italic handwriting done with a dip pen by Bhikshuni Hang Liang and Jerry Joe, her teacher. The youth good wealth first went to the Sala Grove to bow to Manjushri Bodhisattva. The Bodhisattva turned around like an elephant king and gazed at him. From the lion sprint samadhi, the 6,000 bhikshus immediately accomplished the way. The good friends of the fivefold assembly all brought forth the initial resolve and obtained the Dharma door of the guide to basic wisdom. They certified to the minds of the ten faiths. A verse in praise reads, ready for the poem? Upon coming out of the woods, I enter the woods again. To the east of the stupa, in the sala grove, the lion roars, the grass grows green. The elephant king turns his head around and falling blossoms change to red. The 6,000 bhikshus perfect the 10 minds. Within the five assemblies, the lofty ones penetrate with one faith. Take good care, my teacher, while I travel south through a hundred cities of mist and water, endlessly long and far. Isn't that good? That's such a wonderful poem. I find these um, very, the word is evocative. When you read them, the poetry comes through. And I'm, now, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to copy them out. I won't try to show the, I don't think we have them in electronic form. But I'm going to keep track of the, the poems. Take care, my teacher, while I travel south through a hundred cities of mist and water, endlessly long and far. That's the first one. Um, there are 52 more, and they're just outstanding. They're so good. Uh, in setting off uh, Sudhana's pilgrimage, and you, you can definitely feel this is a 20-year-old young man whose life has taken a major turn. Now, the greatly wise Manjushri Bodhisattva has come down to his hometown, sitting in the park, and has now sent him off and said, you're on the path to Buddhahood now. There's a bhikshu out there, Doyun bhikshu. Find him. Go look. Chase him down. Ask him your questions. He'll teach you and then you will know how to cultivate the bodhisattva path. So, we're into it now. This is the, for me it's a thrill because this is the first. We were on the other side of entering the Dharma realm. Should we try to explain it? It's so long. It's a huge chapter. And when will we ever finish? Well, week by week by week, we've now come to Sudhana's first uh, encounter, Manjushri. His beloved teacher has sent him away. You go south. And uh, Sudhana has to uh, uh, say goodbye to his first teacher. So, how cool. All right. There we go. Um, we have uh, lots of activities coming up. City of 10,000 Buddhas has got lots of things going on. We've got... Uh, um, Buddha Root Farm, Master Hua's Nirvana, 10,000 Buddhas Repentance is being bowed now, and I, I'll show everybody. Um, if you go out to, let's see, go out to YouTube. So, uh, let's see here. City, uh, let's see, CTTB Live, is it? CTTB Live. Here we are. 10,000 Buddhas repentance at City of 10,000 Buddhas. Here it is. Okay. Nope, nope, nope. So that's, uh, we don't want that. 
Um, if you can find the uh, link to join right here on um, Zoom, if you want, um, I will copy, let's see here, share, copy. I'll paste that in the chat and uh, our SysOp can pass that on to the folks watching. If you're able, not everybody can get to YouTube. Uh, listeners in uh, China, other places may have a problem. But if you can, listen in. Here's the schedule. Uh, for those of us down here, many of these practices will be middle of the night for us. But we can do uh, some of them. And it's really wonderful to be able to hear uh, the, the Great Assembly bowing to 10,000 Buddha's names. All right. There we go. We're going to dedicate merit now. And uh, I would like to use our Medicine Buddha mantra to dedicate merit. Hoping that those who don't have enough food can find food. Hoping that those who need medicine can find the right medicine. Hoping that the requisites for shelter and warmth, that everyone has what they need. People who encounter uh, unwise advisors can skillfully extricate themselves and find their way to the right Dharma. Whatever your transference wish is, please make it now. to the Buddhas one more time. Welcome to join. to the Venerable Master.
That's going to do it for us for today. Be well, everyone. Bye-bye now.